we're going to talk about breathing, and breathing obviously is pretty critical to life. It's very critical to life. It is critical to life. <laughs> um, and, and it's going to be something that uh, is going to change with a person's health status. So under normal circumstances, we have what's termed true breathing or eupnea. So eupnea is what one's doing when a healthy individual at rest. And what that consists of is simply contraction of the diaphragm, uh, which, which when it contracts, it expands the thoracic cavity. So the expansion of the thoracic cavity lowers the pressure in the thoracic cavity and air rushes in. And that's how it works. So once there's contraction of the diaphragm, uh, thoracic cavity pressure is lower, it, it becomes a sink, and in comes the air, fills the lungs, and now, um, and the expiration is completely passive. The, there, there's also um, at contraction of the extracostal, uh, intracostal muscles, and relaxation of those is simply, is going to allow, and relaxation of the diaphragm is simply going to allow a passive recoil that then pushes the air back out. So inspiration is active and expiration is passive in eupnea. Now that is, um, that is sufficient if your breathing rate is, uh, is at a um, resting level, but it, it's not sufficient as you, as you breathe um, uh, more rapidly. Um, but just that, that simple uh, that simple situation is enough for you to understand uh, what ha the way that we now treat, the way that sleep apnea is treated. And th this is the, um, if not exclusive, it is the, is the very predominant treatment for sleep apnea. Now sleep apnea, before I talk about the treatment, uh, has, there are two forms. One is obstructive, meaning there, there's just, there's something obstructing the, 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 the airway uh, during the, the cycle of breathing. And the other one is a central uh, version of sleep apnea, which uh, is a, the etiology of which is, or the pathophysiology of which is, is um, more complex and less well understood. In either case, whenever there is sleep apnea, the treatment is to provide continuous positive airway pressure. So in other words, if there's a collapse in the airway, you're just shoving in air and you're using that shove in air to, uh, to re-expand it. And that's it. So it's just as mechanical. The treatment for sleep apnea is just as mechanical as eupnea is mechanical. Um, eupnea depends on essentially just contracting the diaphragm in some kind of a cyclical uh, fashion. All right, now what happens when, uh, when breathing gets faster? When breathing gets faster, there's, uh, there, there continues to be this rhythm in the diaphragm. So the, as you remember, the phrenic motor neurons in C3, C4 go out through the phrenic nerve to innervate the diaphragm. And this continues to, to uh, uh, contract in a rhythmic way, but at, in a, in the opposite phase, what you start to get is contraction of abdominal muscles, which makes expiration active. And with increasing effort, you go from no, ex no active expiration, eupnea, to some active e or a low magnitude active expiration, and then the expiration gets stronger and stronger. So you are, I'm sure, familiar with this when you're doing light exercise, you can feel yourself uh, exhaling, but when you're doing, when you, at the end of a, at the end of great exertion, <sighs> you're doing that. You're you're doing a very active, strong expiration. So that's what that's what happens with this. Um, that's how the breathing pattern changes, and this is a this is all due to a central pattern generator. So the central pattern generator for breathing, if we go over here to the board, is in the medulla in an area called the pre-Botzinger complex. 
And the pre-Ratchinger complex has this set of neurons that produces a pattern that will produce breathing. Now, um, this is just like uh, the, the, the central pattern generator, say, for locomotion, in the sense that we can reconfigure this, uh, this central pattern generator to do a variety of different breathing rates and breathing types. We can, and, and this central pattern generator will interact with other central pattern generators. So for example, speech will be timed to occur, articulation will be timed to occur on the expi expiratory phase of respiration, not on the inspiratory. We don't talk as we, as we, I mean, I can't even do it. We don't talk while we're taking in air. We talk while we're put, pushing air out. Okay, so um, this central pattern generator sits in the, uh, ventrolateral medulla and, the, um, and it sends its axons down into the spinal cord to reach C3, C4. Anybody with a spinal cord lesion, a high cervical spinal cord lesion, the, it is possible, it depends on where in the spinal cord is cut, but it is very possible that these axons will be affected. And if these axons are being are affected, then that person is going to need breathing assistance. Um, now, there is a second place in the brainstem, in the hindbrain, that is involved in breathing. And that is this, uh, a region that is either called the retrotrapezoid nucleus or the parafacial respiratory group. Um, this is a region just next to the facial nucleus in the caudal pons. And what's really uh, amazing about these, these cells here is that they are sensitive to CO2. They're sensitive to the concentration of CO2. Now, you may remember from physiology that the, the, um, you're sensitive to oxygen levels through the carotid body, so that you have peripheral sensitivity to oxygen. If, uh, if oxygen falls, you'll know about that from somatosensory afferents that come in through the vagus. But the periphery is not sensitive to CO2 levels. The central nervous system is. And in fact, it's these neurons in the parafacial respiratory group that appear to have, that um, are either the only or one of the, the most sensitive to CO2. So these are the primary, this is the primary group of neurons that's sensitive to increasing levels of CO2. Well, what's going to happen if there's increasing levels of CO2? When would that happen? It would happen, uh, one situation that y is, um, you may think about is exercise. So as you exercise, you're producing more CO2, and that engages the parafacial respiratory group. And the parafacial respiratory group is going to then in, in, um, uh, evoke this act of expiration. The other time when... Uh, there's increasing CO2, as it turns out, it appears to be during sleep. So during sleep, there are increases in CO2 that are automatically sensed by here, and then there's, there's an automatic uh, increase in expiration. And so what happens uh, in people are much more sensitive. Um, so, so there are people that have spinal cord lesions here that are mild, so they're, they're you can think of it as, as, as uh, lesioning, say, 10% or 15% of the axons, some portion of the axon, but not all the axons. And these people oftentimes will be okay during wakefulness, but they will need ventilation during sleep, okay? Because they're, uh, they're not gonna do as well during sleep. Now, um, Finally, I, I want to discuss one of the most interesting um, diseases that, is, uh, that we now understand. We've known about it for a while, but now we understand its molecular basis. And it affects these neurons right here. And this is called uh, congenital, uh, congenital hypo central hypoventilation syndrome. So CCHS, or the, an old name for it, is called Ondine's Curse. 
And uh, congenital central hy uh, hypoventilation syndrome is due to a loss of these CO2 sensitive cells. It's uh, typically a mutation in a FOX2B. Uh, uh, it's actually not, no, I'm sorry, it's not a mutation. It's a, uh, it involves a gene called FOX2B. This is a trinucleotide repeat uh, disease. So there are uh, CAG repeats, and they, um, and there are so many of them that the, this is essentially a neurodegenerative disease. Um, so uh, individuals that show this, uh, that have this uh, disease, um, cannot. They cannot exercise. They can't sense CO2. So they cannot exercise because they cannot change their breathing in response to heightened CO2. And they cannot sleep without assistance. Now, this, if, when you see it in a child, the child probably has it. And then the, the parent, the a parent, has it in a milder form. Because with every generation, with, as is true with all of these trinucleotide repeat um, uh, uh, diseases, the more trinucleotide, the more repeats, the earlier the onset, the more severe the disease. And so, um, so when you look, when you find a child that has it, and this typically does, uh, a, you find out about it in these young, uh, in babies, uh, you then want to look at the parent and see if, if you can find a, a much more mild form in the parent. As we'll pick up in in the final section of videos, um, diseases have a, have a, neurological diseases in particular, have a funny way of not just affecting the person who's affected directly, but affecting everybody. And this is a pediatric, uh, CCHS is a pediatric disease. This film by Tomasz Lewinsky is a 28 minute documentary. It was put up on the New York Times website um, it's called Our Curse, about their young child with uh, CCHS, um, uh, Tomasz and his wife. And they're, it's, the, the video is of them uh, sitting on their couch talking about their reactions, what they're going to do, how they feel about it. It is a, uh, it, it is a very moving very sober uh, treatment of how uh, one individual's disease affects others, in this case, the parents. And, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it is experienced by them as a very devastating turn of events, as one may imagine. So in, in the next uh, video, we're going to talk about micturitions. <laughs>